I'm uh, Gabe Ortiz. I'm a PA. I've uh, been a uh, PA for over 30 years. I've been mostly in pediatric pulmonary and allergy. I'm, I'm hearing your background, Scott. No, it's not mine, but somebody fixed it on this, Kim. Oh, oh, go ahead. You're good. Great, thanks. So I've been uh, practicing mostly in the pediatric pulmonary and allergy, and uh, I did serve on the NIH for the uh, production of the asthma guidelines. But today we are very uh, happy and uh, excited to have joining us uh, Scott Duhane. Scott, uh, introduce yourself, please. Absolutely. Thanks, Gabe. And hello, everybody again. Uh, my name is Scott Duhame, and, and uh, I'm also a PA, physician assistant here down in uh, Texas, and I've uh, been a PA for, um, gosh, uh, 27 years now. And and that uh, that time was divided up between, of course, the military. I did a full 20-year military career. And, and then after I left the military, I was on the faculty at the University of Texas Health Science Center, and then the Children's Hospital, and then the ENT Institute. But, but since 2015, I've been like Gabe and like the rest of the folks on our team with Thermo Fisher. We're part of the medical and scientific affairs team and clinical educators. So, Great. yeah. So uh, the, the topic today, Gabe, my understanding is mold, right? We're going to talk about Thanks. mold. Right, right. Mold and how it affects our patients yep. and, you know, giving maybe our audience some information as to how to avoid mold, how to detect mold, how to test for mold. Yep. So um, how about in your experience, um, Scott, what, what do you find um, is your information to uh, give to our listeners as, as far as mold goes? Yeah, you know, great. Th thanks for letting me start off with all this, Gabe. And let me just say that, you know, uh, you know, we need to kind of level set everybody on, on mold to start out. Because, you know, when people hear the word mold, you know, most folks automatically start cringing or have some other kind of, uh, you know, guttural adverse reaction to, to the word mold. But there's a lot of facts that go with mold that, uh, you know, I think that would be helpful to, to kind of go over. Because when I start talking to patients about mold, uh, there's questions that always come up, the four common ones that come up. So, so let's just level set everybody. And let me give you those four four things that, uh, that uh, immediately come to mind to, to help level set everybody and set the stage for today's conversation. So, so uh, number one, of course, is what is mold? You know, mold, mold is a fungus. And because it's a fungus, you know that uh, I'm sure we've all seen on a bowl of fruit, um, you'll see a little bit of mold and it, can, and it can spread. That's what mold does. But it can also spread over distances. And that can do that because of spores. Spores can be carried through the air, can be carried in water, can be carried by insects. So we, when we think of mold as being that fungus, we know that it spreads where it is located as well as it spreads, it spreads over distances. So then the next thing, number two, that we always hear about is that uh, where can you find mold? Where can you find it? Well, you can find it outdoors as well as indoors. And when you think about mold, think about uh, you know, moisture and nutrients in any place that's warm, wet, and humid, but it can grow really anywhere that has enough moisture and nutrients. And so when you think of outdoors, Think about things along the lines of, you know, rotting wood or rotting grass or compost piles and, and soil and dust, that sort of thing. But also you can think about indoors. And when we think about indoors, what we think about is uh, shower doors, refrigerated drip pans, uh, humidifiers, air conditioners, um, tiles, any, anything, ceiling tiles, as well as um, any place that... Uh, um, you know, even insulation, you could think of that. And think about even something if you have mattresses or pillows that have gotten wet, because again, all you really need is that moisture in those nutrients, where it makes it a great atmosphere for, for mold to grow. And so um, how common is it? Real quick, I should tell everybody how common this is. Well, mold's pretty common. And if you think of, it's found worldwide, and we know that it affects anywhere between 3 and 10% of the population. But amongst asthma patients, amongst asthma patients, it's up to 80% of asthma patients can be affected by mold. So that's an important number to know. And the last part, number four, number four is how does it affect us? Why do we concern ourselves in the allergy community when we're talking about molds? And we concern ourselves because of those symptoms, the typical symptoms that you would think of, anywhere from nasal congestion, post-nasal drip, um, runny nose or rhinitis, and you know, watery eyes, coughing, and that itchy feeling you feel in your nose and the patients talk about it in the back of their throats, that itchiness, that can be caused by, by molds, just like it can be by any, any, uh, any allergen that's out there. So that, that sets the stage. What is mold? Where is it found? How does it affect us and how common it is? So let me, let me ask you, Gabe, let me ask you with your experience. So uh, when, you know, when a patient comes in and talks and asks and, and presents 
with those symptoms, kind of walk us through a little bit. Walk us through taking that history from a patient, maybe doing some testing, and then um, if you're going to be talking to them about exposure reduction, how would that conversation go when you're talking to your patients? Yeah, thanks for that, Scott. I just want to uh, reiterate a couple of really good points that you had, right? We know that mold is both indoor and outdoor. So many times they say, oh, well, you know, I, I'm not exposed. My house is clean and everything else. But like you mentioned, right, places that are warm and moist, you know, around the shower, a couple of places also that people may not think about, right, is under the sink. Maybe if there's a leak, uh, mold can certainly grow there, right? The three uh, factors that it needs, right, is moisture, humidity, darkness, and the heat, the warmth, right? So that brings me to another point. It's outdoor mold, right? Outdoor mold, even though in the middle of the desert, right, I'm in the dry desert, during our rainy season, right, we get that mold increase for about two weeks because we've got what? That moisture, humidity, and the heat, and in the hot summer nights, that mold count increases. And then you bring up a, another good point, right, about the indoor, right? Keep places where people may not look. You talked about the showers, that's readily visible. And uh, I look at this, even in my own home, right, in the washing machine, the gasket of the washing machine is always wet. So probably a good place to look, probably not as much exposure, right, because that door may always be closed. And then another important point that you had, right, because we know that mold spreads by spores, right? These can be airborne. So again, even outdoors, those molds are going all over, even in the house. And that's why sometimes, you know, in talking about target exposure reduction, right, they say sometimes because those mold spores are in the air, a HEPA filter, high efficiency particle uh, air filter, may be able to, to get some of that out of the air. So let's talk about patient symptoms, right, and testing. So I assess a patient, say for example, I assess a patient, they come in, they have a, a, a myriad of symptoms, right? We can see patients that have a lot of different symptoms. It could just be eye symptoms or it could just be nasal symptoms. You mentioned, you know, runny nose, stuffy nose, itchy, uh, itchy throat, maybe post-nasal drip. It may have gotten into the lungs, maybe causing that increase in cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, because we know that uh, exposure, right, can cause inflammation and can cause a lot of different symptoms. So it becomes serious when it starts to cause detriment to the quality of life, right? Maybe increased cough, increased shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, uh, uh, difficulty in your daily activities, which can include sleeping, your work, maybe school, maybe concentrating, right? All things that can, can be related to allergic type symptoms. So in an assessment from a clinic clinician or a healthcare provider, they would assess the patient with this history of symptoms and certainly the symptoms that we talked about itchy, watery eyes, runny nose, stuffy nose, coughing, wheezing, sneezing, could all pretty much look like allergic type symptoms. So in assessment of the patient, we would talk about maybe trying to identify some of those allergic triggers. And it may be also some non-allergic triggers. So the value in testing is you can identify allergic triggers. Maybe if they are negative, then look at maybe some non-allergic triggers. And I'm sure you, you can tell us quite a bit about non-allergic triggers as well. Then you can go on to testing. Um, testing uh, generally for, for allergic triggers can be done either by what we call the scratch test or skin test and or a convenient blood test. We know that many healthcare providers actually do order quite a bit of blood tests. So blood testing can be relatively easy and convenient and they can get what we call a profile. So the nice thing about the profile is it can include both those indoor and outdoor molds along with other triggers that may be causing those allergic type symptoms, such as indoor pets, roaches, cock, uh, cockroaches, dust mites, uh, as well as the seasonal allergens. So I'm sure, Scott, you're aware of that, that testing that can be done and do you have any other uh, tips or, or maybe advice when we look at that testing information, how it can help our patients? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you know, great points. Great points, Gabe. You know, um, 
you know, walking us through that when your, your patients are coming in. Um, one of the things that I see when I, when I see my patients is, you know, they, they might come in and they might tell us, yeah, you know, I, I, I really believe it's the cat or I believe all these symptoms are, are probably the dog or probably, you know, any of the other things that are in their environment. And, and I usually say to them, yeah, you're, you know, you, you very well, it very well could be uh, that cat or that dog. But you know what? That testing that we do, that's going to be able to, to, to confirm that. It'll confirm, yeah, that is that cat or that is that dog. And, and give you that peace of mind if you're going to be doing any kind of a, avoidance for that. But what it also does, what it also does when it comes to doing some testing, is it's going to identify the things that you don't know. Because one of the things we always have to keep in mind when we're talking with our patients, and our patients need to keep in mind as well, is everything that is going to inflame your upper airway and your lower airway, whether it's molds or it's the cat or the dog or anything, everything adds up to inflame that airway. So you may know it's the cat or the dog, but you may not know it's the molds or it's the dust mites. How would you know unless you got some testing? And what the testing is going to reveal for us is that you've been sensitized and that you're actually producing some, some IgE to those individual items, or those individual allergens. And then we can use that and, and take a comprehensive approach for those patients. And so if they do show up with molds and they're seeing you, Gabe, and, 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 I, and I would talk to them about where they can find mold, but are there any other, um, any other avoidance measures that, they can, that you can come to mind to think about when you're, when you're talking to your patients on how to avoid and how to get rid of the mold? Yeah, you know, Scott, you bring up an interesting point. You know, we talked about outdoor molds, right? Pretty hard to avoid. Um, we know during the rainy season, most people are going to be out, right? It tends to be more like in the summertime. We talked about those indoor exposures, which can be kind of heavy, right? Maybe hidden. I think you, you may have uh, kind of alluded to the fact about hidden, right? Maybe you may not be looking in the shower. Probably easy, see, easily seen may not see under the sink where you would kind of have to look for it like i mentioned the gasket of the washing machine but you know you you made me think about one other point you know people like to have indoor house plants and indoor house plants can actually grow mold when you water them too much hopefully you have a, a retaining dish at the bottom and those can actually become infected or infested with mold as well so different things you want to look at and then you talked about testing, which is really important, right? You talked about maybe unknown triggers, being able to identify those triggers. So you mentioned about maybe you know it's the indoor cat or the indoor dog or, or maybe house dust mite, right? And again, the house dust mite, right, which becomes uh, very common in high humid areas. So I always say East Coast, West Coast, and Gulf Coast, right, which are very humid relatively warm in the summer, so dust mite is pretty high as well. But that mold, that mold may not be an exact known trigger. So the advantage of doing those that profile testing, which includes a lot of different allergens we spoke about, right? Maybe the indoor pets, the uh, dust mites, the uh, indoor outdoor molds, and it may be that those molds were not really known that they were a trigger. So the value in testing in those profiles, right, along with the seasonal allergens, right? Seasonal allergens are very common and very difficult to identify and say, I am allergic to that specific grass or I'm allergic to that specific tree, right? Because we know that the seasonal allergen seasons overlap tree overlaps with grass and grass overlaps with weed, but believe it or not, mold can be all year long. And so being able to, as you mentioned, right, identify maybe it's this tree or maybe it's that grass that are seasonal time periods, the mold can be year long. And as you mentioned, they add up. So the idea is you may be worse in the winter time and you think, well, there's no seasonal allergens. Yeah. But again, remember, mold can be year long. So a um, big advantage in identifying the triggers, also knowing that, as you mentioned, you know, if you identify the trigger and you're sensitized to it, right, meaning that you have symptoms and you've confirmed with the testing that you are sensitized, the positive test result, then that will probably a be, be a good clue to say, you know what, I should probably look at mold exposure. Where am I getting that mold exposure? Yeah, very 
good. Yeah, great, great overview on that, Gabe. Outstanding. And, and you mentioned those houseplants. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about houseplants is uh, even if you're not always just overwatering them, but just houseplants in general, they provide nutrients yeah. and it's moist. And what can uh, molds can be transferred, not only, like I said earlier, not only through, through the air or through water, but by insects. So you can get some insects gets a little bit of spore on them and go from plant to plant to plant. So even those folks who are taking great care of their plants always need to kind of keep an eye out for that mold. And if they see some of it, they want to do some kind of mitigation factors, do something to, to, to do some exposure reduction on that. So because it'll spread and it's something to keep in mind. So, you know, Gabe, I was thinking, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, we're, we're talking about all these places to look in your home. And then if you've got these symptoms, and uh, you know you want to go in and get talked to your to your medical provider, your clinician, and get some testing done because again you you don't know what you don't know you don't know those those hidden things those hidden triggers for our allergy symptoms. You know in the news I sometimes hear about uh, and I and I know what I say about this but what what do you say about 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 this whole black mold and and what 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 where do we, where where should patients be thinking about or what should they be thinking about and the questions they should ask. Uh, when they're seeing their providers when it comes to the topic of that black mold? Yeah, we get that uh, question quite a bit, Scott. Thank you for that. Um, in, in talking about mold specifically, right? And that's why generally, um, for the most part, there are four molds that are tested for on the um, national laboratory profiles. And, and those are the four, four of the most common mold, right? So black mold and or toxic mold is really not as common. And uh, again, there's, there's kind of a, a caveat that, that you really have to deal with when you're talking about black mold, right? So black mold is a separate test. It is not usually tested on the more common, what we call profiles in blood testing. Um, I'm not sure if specialists, if specialists test for it, but here's the thing with black mold, right? Um, it's, it, it can be rare, it is more rare. Um, it, it is not fatal, right? Generally, for the most part, doesn't really cause um, real severe reactions, anything more than, than regular molds, but it can make asthma worse. We know that molds, for the most part, can, can make asthma and respiratory symptoms um, worse. But here's the thing with black mold, right, is you know, you can test for black mold to see if you're sensitized for it. And then I always think about in, in talking to a lot of experts, they say, well, then, then you have to prove that you're exposed to it. So if you have mold in your home, then you would have to test that the mold in your home is the black mold, right? I understand that can be kind of costly. It would take an expert to come in and try to isolate um, some of the mold if, if you have exposure in your home and identify that the mold in your home is black mold or toxic mold. So again, it's, it's not as common as the four more common molds that we test for. And then um, just thinking about, uh, you know, we're talking about trying to remove mold and everything like that. And I was reading some additional information and I know a lot of people say, oh, well, I see mold and I try to clean it, right? So probably a really good advice that, that I think would, would help um, our listeners and, and really anybody is if you're going to try to clean mold, as Scott mentioned, remember mold is spread by those spores. So if you try to clean it, and you're and you're rubbing it and you're you're irritating it and you're you're manipulating that mold you're sending mold spores in the air so probably a good idea to wear some protective covering maybe goggles uh, a mask uh, uh, an n95 mask if you're doing that or right leave it to the experts right because they come in they're covered they're well protected right um just the same as you see mold on on food right you're better off not exposing yourself to that mold on food because again those spores are readily um uh, airborne right and you can be exposed to those as well so it just just another thing that came to mind when we're talking about right trying to clean that up right probably a good idea to to wear some protective uh, gear when you're doing that and then maybe uh, maybe leaving it to the experts if if that's the case. But Scott, anything else? Any additional comments you think that would no, help when we talk about? Yeah, let, let me just say that, you know, I can't stress the point that you just stressed enough 
Um, and that when I talk to patients about, look, if you're going to be doing an investigation in your home, you know, once, you, once you've gone through, we've right. done some tests, you, we see that you're sensitized to mold, you're seeing you're having these respiratory symptoms, we're, we're attributing that to the molds. If you're going to be doing some cleaning, you really got to wear a mask. The last thing you want to do is take a big old inhalation of a bunch of spores you're not going to see the spores all the time. So they're there and you're going to take that all in, especially, especially if you're an asthma patient, an allergic asthma patient, you really want to be, be careful of that. And especially if you're, you know, you're cleaning in your child's room or you're, you're cleaning up those areas, do all of the areas with the appropriate um, cleaning. And if you're not sure, again, like Gabe said, like you just said, Gabe, you know, get some advice, get some, get somebody who, who knows what they're doing. And, uh, and you can, you can download some things off the internet that can help you, but there's also some professionals out there as well. And so, yeah, you know, it's been, a, it's been a great conversation, Gabe. I think that, uh, I think we covered quite a bit of what is a mold and how does it affect us? Um, you know, and as we're talking, I'm, I'm actually thinking about, you know, I, I often tell this story about a patient that, um, that, that I, that I, that I'm, I'm associated with one of the, I have a, a, a program that we do, uh, talking to medical providers, and I had done a program talking to them about something like we're talking about right now, utilizing IgE testing to find out what a patient's allergic to. And so I w had gone down to New Orleans and did this program talking to these all these pediatricians down there. And one of the pediatricians, uh, Dr. Clark, she was starting to do um, all respiratory profiles on all of her asthma patients, all of them. And of course, respiratory profiles on her allergic rhinitis patients as well, the ones presenting with these symptoms. But her asthma patients, upon doing these uh, respiratory profiles, she was able to step her patients down on the amount of controller meds that they were using. And one patient came to mind and she called me about this patient. The patient's name was Charlie. Her real name was Charlotte, but they called her Charlie. And Charlie, sure enough, had moderate persistent asthma. And after she did this respiratory profile, she was able to step her down on her meds and, and, uh, and, and, and by, based upon doing some um, targeted exposure reduction for what she was allergic to. So she stepped her down and she became a mild persistent asthma patient. So she was very happy and everything was going great. But then about eight months later, things were not going great. Charlie started waking up in the middle of the night with symptoms again, started having nocturnal cough and waking mom up. And so mom's like, well, you know, something's wrong here. Let's go back and see Dr. Clark because something's up. We were doing great. Everything was stable. Well, everything was going great. So sure enough, she goes in to see Dr. Clark. Dr. Clark said, ask first question. You know, you got all these symptoms. You were doing so fine before. We stepped you down on your, your controller meds. What's changed? What's changed in your home? Did you get a dog? Did you get a cat? Did, what happened? You got a guinea pig? What, what, what's different than it was before? And mom's like, nothing's changed. Everything's great. Everything's been the same, except we're getting more symptoms. So what did Dr. Clark do? Dr. Clark said, you know what? Let's do another test. Let's test it again. Let's get another respiratory profile and we'll see what's changed. Sure enough, comes back positive this time for mold. Dr. So Dr. Clark gives, writes out some paperwork, gives it to the nurse. Nurse calls the mom and mom's like, there's no mold in my house. There's no mold here. What are you talking about? I don't have any mold. It's a nice house. It's, it's <laughs> Sure enough, the nurse is like, well, you know what? Just go look. Just look. Do some investigation. Find out. Is there any mold there? And sure enough, where should she start? Where did she advise to start? In Charlie's bedroom. So sure enough, that's what mom did. Mom dutifully went over, went to Charlie's bedroom. Here in Charlie's bedroom, you have a bathroom, you have a wall, and then you have Charlie's bedroom. And in the corner, in the carpet, in the corner, upon investigation, it was found out to be all wet on the floor in the corner. And she pulled up the carpet on the corner over there, got it all pulled up, a whole bunch of mold down there. Yeah. Treated the mold, had some professionals treat the mold, treated the mold, helped out the situation. But the, in, the, the point here, the point is that when I was talking to Dr. Clark and Dr. Clark was talking to the patient, we all came to the same conclusion. It is so gratifying to find out what's causing the problem <laughs> as opposed to adding more medications on right. anybody any one of our providers me you any of us we could all add medications to to control charlie's symptoms or we can find out what's causing the problem and that's much more gratifying to do as opposed to just adding on more meds so so anyway that came to mind and i always think of 
we should always share, our, our, you know, post our wins, right? We always hear that post your win. Well, that's posting a win because, uh, you know, once we find out what's actually causing these problems, whether it's upper or lower respiratory, and, we, and you won't know if it's mold or not unless you get some testing done, as well as all those other um, unknown and hidden triggers that are found only with a test. So keeping that in mind, um, I, I think it's important. And it's a good way to wrap up this conversation today. So with that, I think, um, Gabe, I'll leave any closing comments to you. And, and uh, I hope to see everybody next time. So Gabe, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Thank you for joining us. That's that's a great story. Uh, again, really doing that investigation, as you talked about, you know, and looking, you know, that that triggers you to, hey, let's look and let's find out, see if there's exposure. That's great. You know, just want to recap, um, you know, talking about your symptoms, letting your healthcare provider know, maybe doing that testing, trying to identify those allergic triggers, um, talking to them about uh, certainly your symptoms, you know, how you feel. Um, also want to mention, you know, on allergyinsider.com, great fact sheets. There's fact sheets, you know, about mold and everything like that. And we've certainly been able to get some of that information as well that's open and available to everybody. But thank you for joining us, Scott. I think we're out of time. I don't see any questions at this time, but uh, thank you all for joining us again. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. I'll see you next time. So what? Uh, you there, Kim? No, you're still live.